Hello everyone. Welcome to today's Conversations with Public Health Leaders. I am Dr. Charity, founder of the Next 100 Initiative. Today we have Dr. Bola Oyeledu. She's the CEO at the Center for Integrated Health Programs, CIHB. She was the country director at ICAP in Columbia University, New York. She was, or she is, the first ever female chairperson of the technical review panel of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Malaria, and Tuberculosis in Geneva. She was also chair of the Independent Review Committee of the Gavi Alliance. Welcome, Dr. Bola. Thank you for inviting me, Charity. Great. It's really exciting to have you join us. So let's get you started. Good. Can you please share with us some of your early role models and mentors early in your career and life? Okay, so thank you very much. I think my earliest role model will be my grandmother. And I'll tell you why I say it's my grandmother. She was such an elegant lady, tall, but very hardworking. And I remembered when I was in secondary school, my mom retired as the chief matron of the uh, at General Hospital in Lagos. And then my grandmom, she was just quiet, resilient, very hardworking, very loving. I never heard her raise a voice. And looking back now, she raised six children of her own. She raised her stepchildren. My, my grandfather was a king. She had to do all the traditional stuff. And she was just always quietly resilient. And so she was growing up. I think she was over four, six feet. And that was really tall for someone uh, of her generation. So uh, she was just like, I would look up to her and like, this is my grandma. Then my mother, of course, my mother. And I say my mother because I've seen my mother in the age of, um, in this generation, especially looking at this period around um, celebrating women and breaking the bias. My mother was someone who had, had to um, leave her home because of violence and things like that. And in that age, that was totally unheard of. But she stood her ground and she was able to work with us and raise us into very um, successful physicians. And everybody will say, all of us, the four of us, were either in public health or in medicine. So my father was a banker and nobody went that route at all. So. I think that's it. Then other people that inspired me are people I've come across in my course of life. Professor Nikke Grinch. I always say something. She taught me how to pay attention to details. And this is, she is a good example of women empowering women. And of course, um, others, Dr. Gabby Williams, my first director at um, the ministry where I first started working and who actually shifted my interest from anesthesia into public health and did it in such a way that was one of the men that I know really respected women and promoted gender equality and equity even before it became a buzzword across. Thank wow, you. I mean today is all about listening to Dr. Bola, but I can't but help affirm Professor Nikkei Grange because she was also a role model for me and a mentor and actually inspired me to pursue my master's in public health. So that's really great. So let's move on. Um, from your um, experiences in public health, what would you say are attributes of effective leadership? I think the first thing an effective leader must have, the person must be visionary. The person must be able to see the big picture, must be able to see ahead of time. I tell people vision is not just about this is where we want to go, but that person must even be able to see the outcome, must be able to project the outcome, must be able to project it so palpably. Because until that leader is able to do that, he or she is not able to share that vision. And unless you're able to share that vision, you're not going to be able to carry people along with you, both from the external perspective, the people who are going to be working with outside of your institution and even within your institution because it's important that they all must be able to see that vision. The second attribute which for me is very 
critical is that a leader must be intentional. So you must really be able to say to yourself, what are the things that we need to do? Intentional in all aspects, you must be intentional in how you communicate. Communication is a, is a critical attribute for a leader. You must be able to communicate with your, with, in such a way that the language, both verbal and non-verbal, are re, really reverberates. You also must be a good listener because you must also hear. You must hear the verbal, you must also hear the non-verbal. Then, I, for me, it's also important that you must be courageous. And I say courageous especially when you're a woman. When you're a woman, you must never forget, especially coming from this side, and I know it's still very, it's still pervasive in the northern hemisphere, maybe not as much as you find it here, but in this, in this, in this climb of where we work, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Nigeria, it's still, it's still there. Sometimes it's overt, sometimes it's subtle that women are to be seen and not to be heard, sorry. And then, so you go into a place. I go with maybe my, one of my male directors, and I'm introducing myself, I'm the CEO, and they're looking at the other guy to be the one to be the CEO, you know? So that's expectation. So sometimes I, in fact, uh, that's one of the things I also think as a leader, you must be able to laugh at yourself, you know, and laugh at things. I just laugh and I say, I'm going to watch the dynamics change now when we do the introduction and things like that. But, you know, it's also important that as a woman, you must have that courage. And the courage is not just at the work that you do, it's also the managerial courage. The managerial courage to know how to manage your team, lead your team, and empower your team to lead. And you must be able to be courageous to point out those things, the diversity things, the things that bother on equity issues, equality issues, the things that bother on integrity issues. As a woman, you must be able to look at those risks and you must be able to really nip them in the board. And then one of the things that really, really is critical is emotional intelligence. I always tell people that as a leader, one of the things you, and one of the gifts, and I'll say this because this is really woman. The gift of the woman is that because we are, we are by our genes and by the learnings and by the socialization, we can multitask. I always say women are great listeners and they're very intuitive. So build your intuition and nurture it, grow it so that you can also be able to use it. So, when sometimes something is telling you that this is not right, mm -hmm. trust your instinct because it's not because you're just thinking it. It's a culmination of the experiences over time mm -hmm. that you've gathered or you've garnered across that you are bringing to the table and it's telling you through your subconscious to say, take a cue at this. So I've seen times when I've hired people and people are like, these are, you should not hire them. And I'm saying, don't worry. I think I can feel something, I can hear something, I can sense something, mm -hmm. and we just need to bring this person out. Mm -hmm. And I think with that, I'm able to really find and keep the best and also grow people because it's very important. I tell people that as a leader, you must mentor, mm -hmm. you must grow people, you must do it intentionally. Mm -hmm. You must be able to empower them so that they grow in their confidence and they grow in their knowledge. Mm -hmm. And even doing all that, it's in that aspect of serving. Mm -hmm. Because a leader should not wait to be served, and a leader should be a server, willing to serve. And that means you're going to go that extra mile to look at your team members to know what is really what makes them tick and understand each person for who he or she is. Thank you so much. Very insightful. And just to draw the attention of um, um, you guys watching this, if you're a female leader, aspiring new leader, still on your journey, I hope you learned about it. Be courageous. And um, so, the next question, can we come
contrast, help us to contrast from your experience the differences or similarity between leading a team internally and then leading stakeholders externally. I think one of the similarities for leadership is communication. Communication is very, very key. How you communicate, how you understand people, how you, how you relate to people, it's part of communication. How you, how you interact with people, how you draw people. So externally, how you build confidence. So you're a CEO, you're an emerging leader, you want to be taken seriously. First of all, you must be sure of your facts at all times. Mm -hmm. So you must be knowledgeable. I always tell people one of the things that I've learned from a very young age is leadership is learned. Mm -hmm. You actually learn how to be a leader. So young people need to invest on that intention, be intentional about doing that. And then communication cuts across. You're working with your team in-house, you're working with external stakeholders, Communication is key. The second key factor is you must be knowledgeable about what you, you are talking about. You know your onions. But then, be humble enough to say, you know, I'm not the repertoire of knowledge. I'm willing to learn new things. One of the things I see, which is sometimes the, the differences, one of the differences is that people think as, a leader, you must always be the repertoire of knowledge. But that's not true. I tell people, you actually be the sponge for new learnings. And new learnings means that you know almost everything about every unit, about every section. You know about accounting enough to be able to let your chief finance officer know that I understand what you're talking about and I can, I can guide you, I can also learn from you and that means you are open enough to learn from everyone the second thing about what's cross-cutting especially in the similarities is the ability to know um, when to back off sometimes we we don't do that we think we're in people's faces but leadership is also about knowing when to no, this is enough and say, well, I can't push past this. Because sometimes you see people with external stakeholders, especially donors, you want to push a lot of things and it's more about your own point and not about theirs. And at the end of the day, you alienate people. So be a good listener, which comes down again to communication and things like that. Then I also say one of the cross-cutting things skills is emotional intelligence emotional intelligence this is very very important and this is something you you learn but you also acquire and you nurture it you're not born with it people will say i don't think people are born emotionally intelligent you actually nurture it you learn a lot from i tell people you learn a lot from other people's mistakes and you learn from yours you intentionally admit to yourself that you make mistakes. I remembered one time one of our external stakeholders, not somebody who was my favorite, and she had told me, she said, Dr. Yoledo, you talk a lot. And I said, and I first of all wanted to, she said, learn to listen. And I went back and there was, it was a point in my life where I felt that, okay, she might have a valid point. And I said, you know, for the next three months, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to get into meetings. When I need to talk, I'll talk. When I don't need to talk, I'm going to really be conscious, make a conscious attempt to listen more. And I found that in that, when I made that decision, I became a conscious listener. I picked a lot of things. I learned more new things. And I could remember some of the people in my funding office actually came up to me and said, is something wrong with you? You stop talking. I said, no, I didn't stop talking. I just started listening more, you know, and that really helped me a lot because I also was able to introspect. And this was one of the things that made a difference because I could then go back, reappraise my team more holistically to say, where are we, where do we need to step back 
take these learnings and work on them to become a better organization. So it's also very important that we have that ability to do that. I think the other thing that that's really, especially from me, the difference, especially from an external stakeholder perspective, given that a lot of the work that we do, I'm in the NGO community, so we try to raise resources, whether it's funds, with matching funds or whatever. So you have to be persuasive. You have to be able to know what the results are. You must be able to understand your stakeholders, map them thoroughly, and then be able to know what they need at that point in time. There is no point in coming to tell them about everything, but it's really aligning your vision to what theirs is. They will tend to listen much more easily to you and rather than you come in and where in two, three minutes they're tuning off. And just another lesson from that, the difference is also, as I've said, you must be intuitive. Mm -hmm. You must be able to read your environment at any time that you are working with external stakeholders. Mm -hmm. You sense when you're not communicating. Mm -hmm. Step back and rejig yourself very, very quickly. That's another skill. You must be agile. Right. You must be very, very agile. You must be able to reinvent yourself very quickly, especially in the NGO world. That is something that you need to do. And growth in an organization is just even from the theory of it, it waxes and wanes. But you have to be able to know when you come down to the, to the, to the valley, mm -hmm. what are those things you need to introspect on mm -hmm. so that you can rise up again. Maybe what cuts across, both from the organizational perspective, internal perspective, and the external perspective, two words come, come out very clearly to me. Innovation and creativity. Yes. We must be very innovative. We must be very creative. That's what makes us stand out as leaders. That's what makes you must be able to say, how am I going to get the attention internally of my team? What are we going to do differently? How do we make sure we are reinventing ourselves and still remain results focused? And also be able to do that to your external stakeholders. How do you come across as somebody you can run with an idea very, very quickly and be able to get even beyond their own expected report results. Wow. 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 Dr. Bola has always inspired me. He's one of my role models, always inspired me. So you can imagine how I'm good feeling getting all additional inspiration during this uh, conversation. Thank you. I mean, Thank you. from I hope you heard the part where she was intentional about wanting to be a better listener. What it tells you that you need as a leader to want to improve at all times and listen to words that encourage you to tell you about improvement. The other point you made so crucial about communication, for example, for external stakeholders, I want to ask a bit more about that. Right. The role you had with the technical review panel, the female chairperson of such a powerful, in quotes, group, powerful in the sense of um, the, the role you were playing. Let me speak about communication. You know something about your experiences, recognizing as a multicultural group. So, any experience you can share will be really helpful. Thank you. And I must tell you that when I was going to become the chair, I was the youngest. Wow. I was also female. Wow. And it happened at, uh, I became, I, I got elected as vice chair at my first TRP. So it was really initially daunting because these were professors. When I say you yourself, you've been there, you know them very well, professors, experts who've published books, London School, name the schools, you know, and for them to now all come together and say, we want you to lead us. I said, first of all, I, I was like, okay, what is it that is in me that they've seen? And, and you actually, actually have campaigns and, and there was this professor, professor, he died later, Yivo, I'm sure you remembered me, white-haired, um, Belgian, public health, renowned expert and he said, Bola, you can do it. And I'm like, 
And are you sure? But then, uh, as we sat and we made the campaign um, themes, because they were the ones now pointing out those attributes within me which they felt I was bringing to the table. So first of all, that first became my sounding board and my reference point that if they've seen this in me, the best thing I have to, what I owe them is to go and be a better person at those things. Then the gaps, I needed to be able to make sure that I filled them. So the first thing I did was that, yes, I needed to, I needed to listen, I needed to learn, and in learning one of the skills I had to do very quickly, I, I, you, those days were the paper days, so we had these huge mountains of proposals. I would literally read every single country. If I could not read it, I would read at least the summary. So that way, for each of the countries, I was totally into it. I understood it, so I could discuss it. So that's what I always say, you empower yourself. You become knowledgeable, and once you're knowledgeable, about what you're doing, you don't have to be the expert. The expert is the person who has that narrow, narrow knowledge and has everything about it. But when you are knowledgeable, you are able to talk about things. And as a leader at the at the chair, that was one of the things I was able to draw. And I was able to look at each person's skill and be able to draw them out so that they could potentiate each other. And I think in that potentiation. I was able to get a lot done. The second thing I was able to do then was that it was at a point when the UN partners, everybody saw the TRP as just being somewhere, nobody could see them until they come out like the, um, like the election of the Pope waving the white and smoke. smoke and everything. Then I said, no, you can't be doing that. If these funds are to go to countries to help them improve, if these countries don't have the skill to develop good proposals, we owe it to them at this point. The technical partners who are going to work with them, let's give them that information that these are the things that we need to do. We're all a group of experts. They don't even have the resources to bring us together per country. So what we can do that will be useful to them is give the feedback that they can go and use and help the countries, the technical persons, developmentally work better with the countries. And we should play more role more active role, the knowledge we have, make it available to the leadership at the Global Fund. And that was what changed the trajectory of the TRP at the Global Fund. I hope you're inspired. You hear what she said? She was the youngest at the time, female, leading a global group of experts. So be inspired. You made a comment um, about being knowledgeable. You know what you said? I'm going to write on that in the next question. Right? So, if you know, you know. You can actually say to your chief accounting officer, fine, let me direct you this way. So, share with us, what do you look for when you're selecting people to be on your leadership team or management team? What should this be? The first thing I look for is the passion. The passion the person brings to the job will enable that person build his skills, will enable that person go the extra mile, will enable that person learn new things because that person is willing to go beyond 9 to 5, the regular. The second thing I look for is integrity. How that person communicates, what are those person's values? Are those values aligned with our organizational values, are they aligned with my personal values, especially if I'm, my professional values, I mean, if I'm the one going to be overseeing that person. Those become very important. The third, because I always tell people, it's not, and I see it manifesting now, especially in the U.S., in the Northern Hemisphere, my, I have a, an almost 28-year-old son, and he's always telling me, Nobody's asked me at interviews for my degrees. They ask me for what I know and what skills I bring to the table. So in my interviews, in our interviews, in my organization, people think you're going to ask them about the book thing, you know. We don't ask you about such things. We ask you about your practical life experiences. 
how you've addressed this, how you've dealt with issues, how you've dealt with life issues, how you've dealt with complications. Those are the things that actually give an insight into the kind of person you are. We don't get it 100%. Sometimes, because it's 30%, 30 minutes, one hour interview yeah. is not going to get you the, the, everything about that person. But it gives an insight into what makes that person um, tick. So we just look at those things. And for me, it's also very, one thing that's very important to me is your perspective on gender. Because your perspective on gender becomes very crucial when you come into an organization. I always tell people, we are coming into an organization, it's not about liking each other. If you like each other along the line, perfect, it's good. What is very important is about respecting each other. Because the moment you begin to respect each other, you respect each other's opinions, you don't throw down anybody's thoughts, you don't, even when you have to help someone learn, you do it from a learning perspective, you are not doing it from a castigating perspective and things like that. And then you become more open-minded, you're able to take on new things. series, you will observe that some points are beginning to resonate. Integrity, passion, vision, people skills. Remember these and stay inspired. I'll ask you another question. So, how have you approached, I mean like you said, we do our best to recruit the right people. But how have you approached people who are not fit? After all said and done or Underperforming. Okay, so basically, when it's underperforming, you know, when I talked about, I talked about courage. There's also what we call managerial courage, the courage to be able to bring out things, bring out things in the sense that, first of all, your systems. Do you have a very good appraisal system? Both formal and informal, where people are able to get feedback and also give feedback. It's very important. Now, if you find somebody that is underperforming, the first thing I want to ask is that, is this a new thing or is this being constant? How have you been measuring that person's performance? Have you given tasks and have you challenged that person in terms of what are the what, what are his skill set? What does he bring to the table? And then the second thing you also have to go and find out, are there issues? So if the person has been performing before and then all of a sudden he or she is underperforming, the first thing you want, have you had a task that have set that person up for failure without giving, empowering that person with the knowledge? People, one of my favorite things when I'm talking to people, when we're discussing, especially our work, is that I like to break things down into the barest simplicity, A, B, C. So like, you're going over this, going over this. I said, because I can be an impatient person. Mm -hmm. And so I take my time because sometimes you're going somewhere and I'm already there. So I take my time to really try to explain that these are the things we want done. So it's very important that people get a clarity of what they're supposed to deliver. So when you've done all that and people are not delivering, the truth is, when you, when you hire someone, it's whether that person is the right fit. Sometimes the person is not the right fit. Then you have to let the person go. Or uh, the person would even say to you after some time, because by the time you go through all these processes and things like that, then the person will just say, you know, I'm not sure I'm the right fit. But what I find most interesting is that most people, do not underperform. Most people are underperforming because of a root cause. So it's very important that first, as an organization, as an individual, as a supervisor, as a mentor, you want to understand what's driving this. And once you're able to understand that, then you are going to be able to, 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 to address it. 
address that. I can share a very quick insight into one of the things I've just, just something like this happened and in my office yesterday and uh, and I'm not going to, let me just say it's a story. Yes. yes. So, and somebody has said, oh, I'm going to send in my letter of resignation. This is normally a good person, a good guy, hard, well, hard working, maybe not smart working. And then I now said, you know, you're good. Why do you want to leave? You're not, you've not been pulling your weight at your job, but you've also, uh, you've also had new tasks added on. Have you taken time to find out, to learn about this new task? And he opened up and he said, you know, I check, uh, I go online, I've not been able to complete it. And as I said, if you're not able to complete online, don't you think maybe taking five days off-site yeah. to really go to a city? And then he said, oh, where I came from before, they say Nigerians usually try to learn, we like too many certificates. I said, yes, but sometimes there is a need to really go and immerse yourself and really understand why. Then I asked the person a question, which now gave me an insight. I said, is it that you think sometimes people treat you like maybe the people are inferior or superior? I said, no, I'm superior to them. I said, good, I like that. I said, why do you think you're superior to them? Because you're a nice person, because you try to help people, I said, well, life is not like that. Life is really about what are you bringing to the table? Is it at the same weight? I said, challenge yourself. Make sure you know more than that person. And then you'll find that you can relate, you can understand, you can do your job better. Otherwise, you keep moving from one organization to the other. And I find that, especially with young people these days, the first... The first sign of a challenge at work, the first thing they think of is, oh, I need to leave, I need to go to another place. But what makes you sure the next place is better? What makes you sure that these same problems would not crop up? And I was taught, because when I started at the ministry, I remembered I was pregnant after about almost six years of infertility, and I was working with a boss that was very challenging, I wouldn't say difficult, very <laughs> challenging, but also became one of my learning moments because I decided that this was going to be a learning time for me. And by the time I said I was going to leave the ministry, I remember one of my mentors and my boss, my boss then, Dr. Gabby Williams, and he actually got me interested in public health. And he said to me, he said, you're here, this is the ministry. You don't leave the ministry because of anyone. You came by yourself. When you're going, make sure when you're leaving a job, yeah. you're leaving because you're inspired to do something else. Mm -hmm. You are moving on to greater heights. You're not leaving because of anybody. Mm -hmm. And that stuck with me. A leader leads people. And in many situations, the most also reports up. Whether to your board or to even the president, you're able to the people in the good society. Can you share your experiences in any of your leadership roles about reporting up? I think the first thing you need to do in reporting up is transparency. You must be openly transparent and transparent on everything. So you are not selectively transparent. You are not transparent on when you are winning. You must be transparent about the challenges. You must be transparent about the downtimes, and you must, in that transparency, be truthful. Carry people along. Let them know what the issues are. No one, no one likes surprises, especially when they're unpleasant surprises. And as, as a very senior person, that is one of the things you have to nurture. The ability to say, you know, things are going wrong. I need help. Everyone needs help. At one, and that's why you have a board, for instance. The board should be a group of people who can actually help you and who can also be able to advise or come in and provide that exchange. The second thing you must be able to do is build trust. Trust is very important when you are reporting and build confidence so that even if that person is not there, if I say, Dear Charity, can you help to get this done? And you say to me, I'll get it done in the next 24 hours. 
one of the things I always let my um, staff know, especially when you are managing external stakeholders, things might happen, life happens. Things might happen that you may not be able to get it done in 24 hours. You must be able to be courageous enough to alert that person and say, I did give you a 24 hour thing, but the way things are going today, I may not be able to get there. But what I see more in most instances is that people just wait and then they don't meet the deadline and then everyone is upset and then they're apologizing. And by the time you do it second or third time, it's actually becoming an integrity issue on your part. So stick to your word, keep your word, be transparent, build trust. Thank you so much. So, as a leader, clearly from all we've heard, busy times, hectic schedules, you know, a lot of requests for your time. People are demanding your attention, your presence. How do you decide what to say this to you? What to say this to you? You know, it's so interesting because this morning, I opened my mail about three hours ago and someone from Bangkok had sent me a mail and she said, can I talk to, can you help me look at this table and get it back? I need to do something with it and I need your input. And I looked at my schedule for today. I have you, I had the conference I'm doing, I'm going to my daughter's school for something before I would see a way of squeezing it in. And so I find that I really don't have time for myself but now I'm learning to really say no so I said to her I said I'm sorry I would really have loved to help you with this evening but I'm fully booked I don't I have I'm busy I already prepare our commitments if this time wait till the weekend I'll get to it if not I'm sorry I can then she sends back to me again and says okay then can you do a 15 minute call I said, okay, when I go on break, I might be able to do a 15-minute call, but it has to be at exactly my break time. So it's only when I finish this interview on my way to my daughter's school, that window of 15 minutes can come in and I won't do that. So you have to learn to say no. That is the bottom line. If you don't learn to say no, you'll find that you drive yourself too much and you may burn out. And it's very important that you don't burn out at the work that you do. You must enjoy what you're doing. You must take pleasure in what you're doing. You must not let what you're doing, what you love doing, be a punishment to you. Wow. That just leads perfectly into the next question. Perfectly. What do you do to stay refreshed, to stay renewed, and to thrive, given the pace of work? Okay. So, one of the things people know that my Saturday mornings are sacrosanct. I haven't told my son, I said, you know, in Nigeria, wedding is such a big issue. If you're getting married, I'm not getting out of bed before 10 o'clock. On Saturdays, <laughs> I don't come out you of told bed. You that. Yes, I said, so you better start the wedding at 2 p.m. And he just started laughing. I said, because one of the things I've learned is that you have to have a me time. No matter what, every week you must be able to um, unwind. And you don't have to do any big thing to unwind. For me, what I do to unwind, Saturday mornings, I don't come out of my bed. Unless, it's, unless the world is about to shake or something really, everyone knows. I'm in my bedroom. I take it, my favorite book, even if I'm not sleepy, but I'm lying down, doing something. Not just thinking about work, not thinking about anything. Now I have a little daughter, so she even she comes in. No, but what she's done now, she knows I won't come out, so she snucks into bed. She's reading, <laughs> pretending to read a book or trying to learn to read a book. Don't let me say pretend because I want her to read. And then I'm reading my book. I just say, Mommy, you are reading. I say, Yeah, we are reading together, you know. So that's what I do. So I make sure that Saturday mornings, that's four hours every Saturday. And it, I intentionally started doing it because I. I have to tell you the story of how I got there. When I started out, because it's very important as a young um, country director, and I was shuttling between Lagos and Abuja then, so I would go to Lagos, and when I get home, like a Friday evening, I would see this pile of social invites. I have three weddings, four mini ceremonies, and you know, I would try. I'm going here, I'm going there, I'm going there. Then one day I came home. I was totally exhausted on a Sunday evening 
I was going to go to the airport to catch the flight first thing by 5 a.m. on Monday morning, and I was almost dying. And I said to myself, nobody sent you. If you <laughs> die, they'll just think that life will go on. So the very next time I came home, I saw the cards quite all right, and I took them one by one. I'm not the mother of the bride. Pour it into I don't have they will miss me. Pour it into you. And I still see a lot of my friends, a lot of our younger contemporaries going round and round and round. The truth is that if you don't take care of yourself, no one else will. Self-care. Self-care is key. So crucial. Thank you for sharing that. We're rounding up shortly, but we can't um, avoid talking about the pandemic. Yes. So just quickly share with us what has the pandemic taught you about public health leadership? So, pandemics. We thought a lot of things that we're doing now could not be done. Mm. So before we didn't believe in remote work. Mm. Now we all became experts at working remotely. And one of the things we quickly learned because our work at that point in time, needed us to be very agile, needed us to be very resilient and very responsive because nobody knew where, where this was going. We didn't know the effect on people living with HIV. So we needed to take extra care. People could not come to clinics to take their medication, total lockdown and things like that. So, and they had to be rich because, of course, if you're not reaching them with medications, they're becoming, um, um, resistant mm -hmm. to the medication and that's going to be more expensive to deal with. So we had to put on our thinking caps and it's amazing because the solutions came from different people. We learned to work with each other remotely, we learned to trust each other more and then when we had to open, we knew that we had to open cautiously mm -hmm. so we had to take care of people coming in. Mm -hmm. We also had to do emotional checks because People got infected in the course of work. And this was something, no vaccines at that point. People didn't know the trajectory of the disease. We've had people die. We've had people losing their lives. So we had to form like support groups so that each of our team member who got infected will know we actually got like kits. We will deliver the kits to them. And then we had people call them in the morning and in the evenings just to check in with them. Even people who had to go into isolation centers, we kept making sure that their mental health was paramount to us. So we found that um, supporting each other, the pandemic taught us how to do that much better. It taught us how to work better remotely, and it taught us also how to monitor productivity because that was something a lot of people didn't talk about, but. And I'm sure you saw a lot of cartoons and jokes and things going around when people will just carry their wig and put it on, you know, two just, before just, the just a second before the call, you know. So, but it also helped us to really come up with new ideas. And together we found that we were able to surmount and really become a more resilient organization. Wow. I mean, we can go on and on and on. You can never get enough from a public of media, you know. So, everything you spoke about, the initiative, the rest is Everything. Mm -hmm. But if you were to leave three critical <laughs> points with this emerging generation of public health leaders across the continent, what would those three points be? Okay. On leadership, the first thing I'm going to say leadership is service. A lot of people don't look at leadership as service. The think leadership, you are going higher. But I tell my, my staff that you can all go home, but the box stops with me. When things are going well, my funders are not going to call me most of the time. But as the first alert sign, you are going to be the person they will call. And so leadership is all about service. If you cannot serve, I'm sorry, you can be a good leader. The second thing is leadership is intentional. It is learned, it is intentional, and it is lifelong. You learn every day. The, 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 the courses only just tell you. You learn by the practical things that you do. So you must be intentional in everything, and intentional to succeed, intentional to get to where you are. 
Then the second, the third thing that I want to leave, leadership is a lot of communication. You must be open, you must be a good listener, you must be persuasive, you must be an excellent communicator. And you'll, at least you'll be able to, if you combine those three, I think you'll be able to get a lot of the other things in. Wow. And I want to say something. Please. Well, you've also been one of my good... I learn from people. And I tell people that, because I said leadership is learned, you've also taught me a lot of things. And maybe this is an opportunity to say it to you. You are someone who is so patient, very quiet, you know, but very resilient and very result-oriented. So I always look at you and I say, you know, let me use the favorite word, well, I calm down, you know, <laughs> it will get done. <laughs> That's very encouraging. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing You're that. Welcome. Wow. So there you have it. I, I don't know where to start from, but I think you need to watch this over and over again to maximize the content um, of these conversations. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for having you. me. And you stay inspired. And look out for the next conversation with Coffee for Eagles. Thank you. Bye bye.